Okay, let's, uh, let's go ahead and make a start here on the second day of October 2012. Um, my plan today is to finish up a consideration of uh, swim bladder dynamics in fishes and the connection between uh, those dynamics and gas bubble disease, which is where I will end. And then I want to move on and talk about bioenergetics, or at least begin a consideration. I have uh, given the local folks uh, handouts for both those presentations. There's the swim bladder and there's the bioenergetics presentation. I um, want to point out while we've got the archive up that all of the files that I have generated thus far or files that we are using that are old files that I've moved up into the 2012 archive, all the AVIs I've converted to MOV files. And uh, so they all have a link that's the MOV link. And you click on that, download, you get the MOV file, which will play in QuickTime, even on Apple's, right, Julie? And that's really good news. And I, I brag about all that up here, and I give credit where credit is due. Um, okay, some really good news. And that, has to, that tells the story and says thanks to Ray, who discovered the general remedy, and Julie, who discovered that it works with Mac. And why shouldn't it? Because QuickTime is an Apple product. So that's great. Um, and I hope it makes life easier for those of you who are running Windows 7. Um, for those who are running Windows XP, um, you can use either the AVI or the a MOV. And I actually prefer the AVIs myself because the file sizes are so much smaller and they're easier to download. That's the only down, real downside. I think there's a little voice quality um, degradation. Even when you play it at 100% speed, I think the voice quality with the MAW file is not as good as the ABI. But, you know, time is money and everything else. So, um, I was reminded yesterday by one of our undergraduate distance students on the stairs that uh, October the 11th is right around the corner, a week from Thursday. And that's where we're going to have our exam. So I know all of you are uh, industriously preparing, right, Chris, for that exam. And distance students have an additional obligation that I'll remind you of one more time, and that is that you need to be working to find a proctor who will agree to proctor your exam if you're not going to come and take it here with us. Um, only one of my distant students thus far has arranged for a proctor, so I urge all the others to uh, get busy and have your proctor contact me and say that they, he or she agrees to do the job, and then I will provide all the necessary guidance. Um, local folks uh, who are not uh, in the classroom here today, not normally here, uh, I hope we'll find it easier to come and take the exam under our supervision, either with uh, local students at 11.10 on Thursday, the 11th of October, or um, if you have a class in, that's in conflict with this one, and that's why you're doing it just in anyhow, then I would like you to come at, uh, right after that class. So this class normally is over at 12.25. I don't... Uh, I don't uh, use time as a weapon when I give my students exams. I give them as much time as they can possibly use. I'd lot rather you be slow and sure rather than quick and, and wrong. So uh, some people will still be working on the exam at, at, at 1225, and at that point, uh, those of you who are distant are welcome to come in and join us, and you can just start at that point. And I'll ask Donovan to help me uh, monitor the process as long as we need to, as long as we need to monitor it. Okay, so that's that. That's that. And you know there is this sample exam up here to show you the format. I've pointed that out a number of times, and I think I've also pointed out that down here someplace in 2011, there is a AVI which I don't think I'll bother converting. It's short. Um, that 
is about the exam. It's sort of last year's um, answering a few questions from local students and distant students on the record. And we can, we can do something like that again if, if there's a need. Okay, so that's where we are. And I think those are the things that I meant to talk about today. Today is a Tuesday. It's lab day. Um, we got lab three uh, beginning this afternoon. Lab two is due. I hope you're uh, working on it if you haven't already finished. Or you need to be contacting your TA if you're going to be late. Work out a deal. Ask for mercy, clemency, something. And I've had a couple of people working through me that I've tried to mediate that arrangement. Local folks, anybody have a question about something that's burning that I haven't mentioned? Is there an urgent thing that everybody's concerned about? Is everybody able to get the files down? And and now that we're doing MOV, I mean, it takes longer because the files are three times bigger, but they do download eventually. Uh, <clears throat> Okay, let's move on then. I'm going to close the browser and uh, go to uh, the swim bladder presentation and finish that up. And I think I was down about, um, I'm trying to recall where I was. Somebody help me. Does anybody remember where we were? Let me, let me back up just a little bit here. Okay, I talked all about Boyle's Law, and I talked about the changes in volume that have to go on when there's changes in pressure. I, we went over the, the filling of the swim bladder, the deposition, right? Uh, we talked about this business. Um, you need to try to understand that business. That's one of my favorite exam questions is to account for the fact that uh, ordinary telios can secrete oxygen into their swim bladders at very high pressures. Um, and tell me about the multiplier and the barrier effects of the swim bladder REIT and gas gland combination. You need to be prepared to do that. Um, maybe I said this, maybe I didn't, you know, I've, the swim bladder reet and gas gland combination um, works with oxygen particularly well because oxygen is carried bound to hemoglobin. Um, and you've got the root on, root off business going on, but that doesn't, uh, you know, the, that root on, root off doesn't affect nitrogen. Nitrogen is only carried in solution. It's an inert gas. So uh, how can you have higher partial pressures of nitrogen in the swim bladder than in the blood. And uh, that's, a, that's a question that I don't think anybody really knows how to answer even now. Uh, there are 30 times, sometimes 30 times more nitrogen in the swim bladder than there is in the blood. So it's multiplied somehow. Um, one answer is maybe it's got to do with lowering the solubility of the plasma for all gases due to the addition of a lot of lactate, so salt, the gases are said to be salted out of solution. Um, maybe it's got to do with the lesser diffusivity of oxygen, uh, I mean of nitrogen compared to oxygen, but I frankly don't uh, understand how that could account for a factor of 30 increase. Gas removal, uh, a little easier to understand, I think. And um, it depends on uh, whether you're a physostome with the tubular connection between the swim bladder and the gut or a physoclist without that connection. In the case of physostomes, all you have to do is simply, uh, as the pressure, um, uh, as the volume tries to increase of the swim bladder gases, as it would, for example, when you rise in the water column, because the pressure is going down, then that automatically could result in an opening of the pneumatic duct and a bubble passing out, essentially burping a bubble out of the swim bladder. Um, and that happens. 
with ice and storms, and it's a pretty obvious event when it does happen. If you have a school of herring, and that school of herring is rising in the water column, maybe being chased by something down beneath, you can often see the evidence in the form of a cloud of bubbles coming up. And those bubbles are bubbles of gas that are coming out of the swim bladders that are over, over inflated as the fish are rising. Um, the big problem, of course, is getting it back down. Once you once you've got once you've lost the bubble, how do you how do you add gas as you go down in the water column? And then we talked about swallowing bubbles and um, maybe grazing bubbles, on, but that's not going to work at depth. So. Uh, you know that that's going to have to involve the gas gland and and uh, secretion of gases from the blood. Uh, the removal of gas, excess gas from the swim bladder, in the case of physoclists and in many physostomes as well, because they also have uh, the equipment to do part of the job, amounts to reabsorbing swim bladder gases uh, into the blood, and that occurs through this specialized. Uh, vascular area of the swim bladder wall called the oval. And it's kind of automatic because, in a sense, when the swim bladder is distended, uh, the wall is stretched, and that sort of causes the, the access of the gas to and the blood to increases perfusion of the oval area by blood. Um, and under normal conditions, the pressure of each swim bladder gas will always be higher uh, in the swim bladder than it will be in the blood because, remember, the gases alone have to counter all of the environmental pressure exerted by the hydrostatic as well as uh, gas pressure, uh, uh, atmospheric pressure in the, in the outside world. So you're going to... You're going to have to do. You're going to have to have more pressure from each gas in your swim bladder under normal conditions than there is in the blood in terms of partial pressure for any depth greater than zero. Um, this come. This came up. I think somebody asked about reabsorption. Maybe I, I kind of remember a question about rate constants, and my data here say that uh, 40 to 240 minutes is the time constant to reabsorb gases from an over-inflated swim bladder. And I guess that would have to depend on what the gas is because it would happen quicker with oxygen than with nitrogen. Uh, what about in gas supersaturated water, though? What I've talked about to this point has to do with situations that involve um, no uh, absolute saturation greater than 100%. If the absolute saturation of a given gas does exceed 100%, then it turns out that the partial pressure of that gas is going to be higher in the water and therefore in the blood, which is in equilibrium with the water, than it is in the swim bladder. And that goes through some quantitative examples here. Let's suppose we've got a caged fish. It's got an equilibrium swim bladder volume at 2 meters. It's moved up to 1 meter in water that has a relative air saturation at 120%. What are the absolute saturations? Well, we just apply our standard equation, partial pressure of the gas divided by the fraction of the atmospheric pressure exerted by that gas plus the hydrostatic pressure. Then we end up with oxygen at 80% and nitrogen at 107% at um, 2 meters. Uh, at 1 meter, I'm sorry, 1 meter. Um, let me get into presentation. Allison forgot to warn me this time. Um, if, uh, let's see. Yeah, okay, that's where we were. Now, next slide. Uh, now, let's suppose that this caged fish, which was at equilibrium in terms of its swim bladder volume at, at two meters, has moved up into, to one meter in this water with the relative air saturation at 120%. Assume the fish had normal air mix of swim bladder gases before the move was made, what must have been the partial pressures? Well, I claim that the partial pressures must have been um, in an 80-20 ratio because that's what they were in the, in the normal atmosphere. And so that amounts, if you're going to get, if you're going to achieve uh, 1.2 atmospheres of total pressure in the swim bladder, and you're going to keep the ratio the same between oxygen and nitrogen, 
then that's, that's going to mean you have to have 0.24 partial pressure of oxygen in the swim bladder and 0.96 of nitrogen. What's the new swim bladder volume immediately after this move uh, from 2 meters where it was at equilibrium up to 1 meter? So we just solved Boyle's Law and we end up with 109%. What are the fish's new swim bladder partial pressures of oxygen and nitrogen after this move? Well, now we're going to have to have, you know, a, an adjustment of those pressures to correspond with this increase in volume, and that's going to be a downward change. And so the sum is now going to be 0.22 and 0.88, again maintaining the 2080 ratio and making sure that the sum is is the right uh, uh, 1.1 atmospheres. Um, so at this point, normally what would happen is that gases would start to diffuse out of the swim bladder because the partial pressures of both oxygen and nitrogen would be greater than the 0.8 atmospheres of nitrogen in the water and blood and maybe 0.2 uh, in oxygen. But in this case, the partial pressure gradient is going to be in the wrong direction. Um, blood um, is going to be higher in both um, the partial pressure of oxygen and the partial pressure of nitrogen if the blood is equilibrated with the water that's supersaturated. So I claim that you would end up with 0.24 partial pressure of oxygen in the arterial blood coming to the swim bladder, but only 0.22 inside the swim bladder. 0.96 nitrogen versus 0.88. So in both cases, the, part, the diffusion gradient favors not the elimination of excess gas from the swim bladder, but the deposition. Um, so we've got a positive feedback situation here that's not good. The higher you go in the water column, the more supersaturated in an absolute sense the water becomes with the gases. And the lower the pressure in the swim bladder, and so the greater the gradient for diffusion, and so you end up just rising like a bubble, unless you can get rid of some gas. And if you're a physicalist, it's hard to get rid of gas, uh, except through the oval, and it's going the wrong direction there. Now, if you're a physostome, and the volume gets too great, maybe you're gaining some excess gas by reverse uh, diffusion into the swim bladder, but you can always eliminate it through the pneumatic duct. The longer you stay there at one meter, the worse it gets. The more gas moves into the swim bladder, the volume increases even more. Notice there's no reduction in the partial pressures or of nitrogen or oxygen inside the swim bladder as long as the swim bladder obeys Boyle's law. Therefore, the swim bladder just continues getting bigger, but the partial pressure stays the same to exactly offset the environmental pressure that's squeezing this fish. Um, so the swim bladder just continues inflating indefinitely until it bursts or stops obeying Boyle's law because the body wall does exert some constraining force that that keeps the swim bladder from expanding as much as it would if it were a perfectly elastic balloon. So, what if the fish is not forced to stay at one meter? You know, it's not in a cage. You take the fish and let it get out of the cage. Um, then, uh, what would happen is, and what does happen by observation, we know, is that the fish is buoyed up okay, and you can tell it's got an attitudinal equilibrium problem. Its tail's starting to get higher than its head as it goes and that sort of thing. And the fish's natural response when it finds itself being moved in a way it doesn't really uh, particularly want to go is to turn around and swim the other way. And so if the fish is able to swim downward um, to a, a certain uh, appropriate depth, the downward increase in pressure causes the swim bladder to be compressed back to a smaller volume. The partial pressures of gases in the swim bladder rise as the volume is reduced. 
until eventually this this counter gradient is 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 um, zeroed, and it turns out, and you can do the calculations that the depth at which no gas is supersaturated uh, in an in an absolute sense is the same as the depth at which this zeroing occurs, and so a fish that forcibly swims downward in the water column until it compresses its swim bladder back to neutral buoyancy volume uh, will automatically protect itself from gas bubble disease if there's enough depth. And if you're in water that's too shallow, then that doesn't work. Or if you're in a cage and can't go. But in, in an open system, in theory at least, uh, you would expect that gas bubble disease and swim bladder dynamics would, would uh, operate sort of in concert in physoclists, Zoe, but not in physostomes. If you're a physostome, uh, or if you don't have a swim bladder, like a shark, uh, you know, you swim around and, and uh, closer to the surface, uh, you're subject to gas bubble disease caused by supersaturation of gases, but there's no signal to tell you that you're in a situation where you should turn around and go the other direction to seek an absolute saturation of 100% or less. There's no signal because in the case of a physostome, if you just imagine this set of... And physostomes tend to have both an oval and a pneumatic duct. So gases start to be deposited in their swim bladders in supersaturated conditions which would cause the swim bladder to, sort of, to start expanding, which would cause them to be buoyed upward in the water. But as soon as they start to be buoyed upward and the swim bladder expands too much, what happens? The pneumatic duct opens and they burp a bubble of gas out of the swim bladder, restoring the swim bladder back to neutral volume and, and obviating the need, eliminating the need, counteracting the need to swim downward to compress the swim bladder. A shark, you know, in theory at least, doesn't have a swim bladder. So when it swims up in the water column and exposes itself to supersaturated gases, there's no mechanism to tell it that it's, hap that it's happened. So, uh, and how deep would you need to go to restore the equilibrium swim bladder Volume deep enough so that the total combined partial pressures of all the gases equal 1 plus 0.1 meters, 0.1 times the depth in meters. So in this case, at least to a depth of 2 meters. Uh, then the swim bladder volume would be stable at the equilibrium volume because oval diffusion through that window would be, or diffusion through the oval window would be, would be stopped at that point. Our so is the claim by Chamberlain et al. That's the apothesis we're talking about. Uh, maybe I ought to just read my own words here. Note that the minimum depth for the swim bladder volume to be equal to the equilibrium swim bladder volume is the same as the depth at which absolute saturation of neither gas exceeds 100%. So in restoring itself to neutral buoyancy, fish also protects itself from gas bubble disease. Provided... There's water deeper than two meters to go into, and provided it's a physicalist. So both those conditions need to be met for this mechanism to have any chance of succeeding. And the question that I raise for you, and maybe I'll raise it again in a week or so, is why wouldn't this work for physostomes? And you know the answer. The answer is because they eliminate their gas in a different way. This is the Chamberlain hypothesis connecting swim bladder dynamics um, with gas bubble disease. And maybe I should have started with this. I've always debated whether I should put this summary thing first or last. But this is the summary statement. It's an attempt to, in cartoon fashion, present this, this idea. You know, here's a fish. It's got a swim bladder volume that's uh, the equilibrium volume. It's perfectly happy. Everything is cool. Uh, but suddenly, there is this um, supersaturation event that occurs, and here's time going along. 
and the depth at which absolute saturation of some gas uh, goes to 100% drops down in the water column. In other words, everything above that is supersaturated. Our fish is, is trapped up there when that happens. Gases start to diffuse through the oval into the swim bladder. The swim bladder expands, buoying the fish up, making it lighter and lighter on its little fins, so to speak. And the natural response is for the fish to turn around and forcibly swim down. And it's, it's, it would tend to swim down until it finally felt comfortable again, which would be the neutral volume, the neutral buoyancy volume. And that depth, it'll turn out, is the one that would put it below the 100% value, so it wouldn't have the gas bubble susceptibility anymore. So isn't that a neat set of mechanisms? And, and it's so neat because nitrogen is, is inert, and it's hard to imagine a biological sensor that would detect nitrogen supersaturation per se. You know, you can detect the effects through Boyle's law on buoyancy, yeah, maybe, at least there's a fighting chance, I think, that it could work that way. And the experimental evidence that we published in this paper says that it does work that way, at least in Atlantic Croker, which is what George uh, did the experiments with. This work was done by a former student, a guy named Dr. George Chamberlain, and he is uh, now uh, an aquaculture advocate and runs an outfit called Global Aquaculture Alliance, it's headquartered in St. Louis. So that's a neat story. Anybody would like to read it in detail? I've probably got some reprints. Any questions about that? Whether you buy the story or not, you need to be able to tell, tell it back to me. And, you know, I would give you extra points if you could point out how it's wrong. <laughs> I don't know that... Uh, I'd say this. Nobody has yet confirmed that this Chamberlain hypothesis... Uh, is, you know, nobody's rejected it as far as I know, but it hasn't really been confirmed either by any experiments that really do support the idea. Nobody's gone in and measured swim bladder volumes and measured them, you know, but it could be done, and somebody ought to do it. Somebody ought to take fish and... and one, one student tried, a student in biology once, but the experiment had a little flaw. There was the water wasn't deep enough. I mean, it was just a tank, and there was no manipulation of the pressure that you needed to do to make the response happen, I think. So it didn't happen. Okay. End of that show. Look at that and think about it. It's a neat, neat story, I think. Let me take you to another neat story that's a lot better known. And that's the story of bioenergetics. You know, uh, you've already uh, dabbled in this uh, here in Biology of Fishes, if not someplace else, in the extension of Lab 2. If you've done that work, you know that you, know, you can apply the information you gathered on feed intake and processing rates and respiration. You can apply that to... Uh, bioenergetics. And what I'd like to do now is walk you through a more formal introduction to bioenergetics as it applies to fishes and point to some neat uh, consequences. You know, this is, this is where, you know, we get the oxygen and the substrates together and do uh, energy and mass balance and decide whether the fish is gaining or losing and if it gains, then maybe it's, it's gaining some size, um, certainly some calories, and it's growing. The whole idea begins with what we call a balanced energy budget. And uh, probably the best, the best source is actually Warren's book, uh, but Brett and Groves published a, a very... Uh, influential paper in uh, the series Fish Physiology back in 1979 that sort of, I think, represents the, the touchstone for most folks who work in bioenergetics of fish. Um, the whole idea starts with the notion that what goes in has got to equal what goes out plus whatever change there is in the system. 
So the stuff going in is represented by AC. That's consumption rate. And the consumption rate has to be equal to the rate at which uh, the stuff that's consumed is dissipated or accumulated. And uh, there's a couple of uh, dissipation terms here. Uh, one of them is AR, that's respiration, which you studied in lab two. And waste, which we didn't quantify, we assumed it, as most folks do, actually, who do bioenergetics, because it's a, it's a problem to measure waste production rates. We'll talk about that. So the W stands for waste, and the R stands for respiration, and the C stands for consumption. And over here at the end, if there's anything left, is, you know, the room for growing. Uh, G stands for growth. Um, growth, as you'll find out, is the one term in this energy budget can, that can go negative. So it's not always growth. It could be loss. And it's not always somatic growth. It could be growth in gonads and gametes. So reproductive increases, an increase in the energy content associated with uh, gametes. Um, this thing is a balanced energy budget um, only over periods of probably a day or so. Certainly over periods of minutes or seconds it's not balanced. So for that reason, most folks use dimensions, uh, time dimensions as we'll talk about here a little later, of days for energy. Um, for bioenergetics and, and energy budgets. In other words, we're going to measure respiration per unit time in shorter periods like hours or minutes or seconds, but we normally convert that to per day rates for figuring in into bioenergetic uh, models. So the units that you could use um, are what I call energy specific um, and mass specific or hybrid and uh, whether you work with energy specific units or mass specific units, <clears throat> um, you can end up with percent per unit time and that's, that's always a dangerous thing because you have lost the sense of what the ancestral dimensions were that gave rise to the percentage. But you can see how this happens, you know, if you're talking about energy specific dimensions and you've got calories of activity going on, calories of consumed, hour, calories consumed or calories respired or calories wasted per unit calorie doing the consuming or the respiring or the wasting. In other words, this is the calories for the process divided by the total calories contained in the system doing the processing, which is the body of the fish in this case, per unit time. So we talk calories per kilocalorie per day. Why calories per kilocalorie? Because you know, normally the rates are small compared to the system. So, you know, you use a thousand offset there just to make it make the numbers not get unwieldy. But if you convert those both to calories or both to kilocalories, then it's easy enough to see that you end up with proportions. So it's a proportion per day rate. And if you multiply that by 100, then you got a percent per day. So that's how you get to percent per day. So let's just think about one, you know, and maybe I've got one down here somewhere, but I'm just thinking that we had maybe 20 calories uh, per kilocalorie de per day. Well, uh, 20 calories per kilocalorie, let's see, that would be 0 0.02 kilocalories per kilocalorie, am I right? 0 0.02 would be 2%. So 20 calories per kilocalorie per day would correspond with 2% per day, I think. You need to be checking my math with me here. I think that's right. Uh, similarly, you can do, uh, I claim that's mass specific, but it's really, <laughs> it's, it's hybrid. It's calories per gram day. And that gets you into trouble because... You know, if you're going to use the calories as your dimension for the activity, then you better be careful with using mass for the dimensions of what's doing the activity because uh, it all depends on how many calories are in that mass. 
And if you have rules of thumb that you apply like we normally do, you can assume that, you know, things are sort of cool at like one kilocalorie per uh, gram live weight for biological stuff. But there's a lot of variation. So it's dangerous to use this, what I call it, mass-specific here, and I really ought to call that. I mean, mass-specific would be milligrams per gram per day, right? And I should have said that. So this is a little bit of an error here. It's actually a hybrid dimensions. Um, energy units conversion, you know, you hear me talking old-fashioned. I'm an old guy. I like to work in calories. To me, calories are natural. I like calories because... You know, the calorie is the amount of heat it takes to raise the temperature of one gram of pure water one degree centigrade, a little calorie. Uh, or you can think about the heat it takes as being 4.1858 joules to raise the temperature of one gram of water one degree. I don't much like that, you know, I mean, so, um, but that's what the equivalency is, a calorie in modern in the modern world, you send a manuscript to an editor, and you talk about calories. They're going to say, what, you know, you've been under a tub for 100 years or something, you know? They're not calories anymore. They're joules. And Newton died in centimeters, you know, and all these strange things, and not horsepower. So, you know, but, but the point is that one set of dimensions can be converted to another set as long as you are careful and conscientious and what I like to do whenever I have to do this is I always work in calories and, and then at the very last step I convert everything. <laughs> and so you end up with some odd looking dimensions when you do that. You know, your 4 inch PVC pipe became 10.8 centimeter CV PVC or whatever the conversion is, 2.54 centimeters to the inch, right? You knew that, didn't you? So 2.54 times times four is is an oddball number because the pipe was made by people who were doing English units and then we're required to express them. And You, you get my point. So anyhow, that's for you to write down and, and take note of that you know you have about four joules for every calorie and therefore a joule is about a quarter of a calorie. Not quite. Mass energy conversion rules of thumb is, I already mentioned this one, that one gram of typical biomass of anything, uh, animal, fish included, and fish foods included, is assumed to uh, yield about one kilocalorie of energy. And therefore, since uh, one gram alive usually converts to, uh, well, Five grams live converts to four grams of water and one gram dry. In other words, about 20% dry weight. That means five grams of, of live weight or wet weight usually yields about one gram when you dry it completely in a drying oven. And one gram dry, therefore, produces five kilocalories because it took five grams of, of wet stuff to make that one gram dry. In other words, everything is equal here. Everything is equivalent. Is everybody with me on this? I mean, you all know these things, I presume. But we tend to forget them. So it help to, helps to have it black on white or green on white, white on green or whatever it is. Uh, so let me just take you through the, the energy budget of a representative fish. You know, this could be ecofish. It could be something else. Uh, probably it's a rainbow trout or a largemouth bass or a bluegill because that's where all the work has been done. Um... Consumption rates. Well, you learned some things about consumption, and some were wrong probably taught to you by Ecofish when you estimated it by looking at rate of evacuation for a full stomach because of the problem of the hump. I hope you played that back, that little thing on ground truth. And by the way, I urge you, and I require you if you're a graduate student, uh, and if you're a conscientious and alert and bright undergraduate who wants to get ahead in the world, I uh, ask you to take a look at the uh, lanyap associated with Lab 2. You didn't need to do it before you did Lab 2, but you need to do it afterwards. And it's called something like Ecofish Does Autorespirometry. Or autorespirometry. Yeah. 
That's, that's the name of the file. Anybody played that back yet? You probably haven't had a world of time to work with, but I hope you will. It's kind of fun to see what it took to get Ecofish to do automated respirometry. Uh, so I'm off the topic. The topic is consumption. And the range in fishes is from obviously nothing at all, in the case of a fish that doesn't have access to anything to eat, to a maximum somewhere between 2 and 25% of body weight per day on a mass-mass basis. Um, it would be 2% per day for a very sluggish adult fish um, going to the other extreme for small, highly active fish. A tuna would be up there in that near 25% range probably. Ecofish probably wouldn't be. You know, ecofish is a normal representative teleost and probably ecofish, uh, you know, in the sizes that you worked with in your simulations would have um, true, I mean, a, a fish, a, a red drum that's 10 grams is probably going to have a, a maximum food consumption rate on the order of 5 to 10 percent, maybe, depending on what it's eaten per day. The rate at which fish can consume food and process it uh, tends to decrease with increasing size. And I say here, typically proportional to weight to the minus 0.3. It's a power function. In other words, maximum food consumption rate is proportional to weight to about the minus 0.3 power. But I've got to tell you, that power is highly variable. And I think it can go up to, say, like minus 0.7 and maybe down to minus 0.1, I don't know. But 0.3 negative is probably a centrarchid number, sunfish number. And I already told you that the more active the fish, you know, uh, tunas have higher maximum uh, consumption rates than other fish of similar size that are less active. How do you estimate uh, consumption? Well, by watching, by looking at uh, stomach contents, processing rates, and assuming that what goes in is going to be you know, equal to what came out. Uh, this is the way you did it in the lab, so I'm just reminding you. Measuring the rate of change of stomach contents and deducting the evacuation rate. So it's a mass balance game. Rate of consumption is equal to the rate of change in stomach contents per unit time less the rate at which things are being removed from the stomach. And we assume that might be Kc. K being the rate constant for stomach evacuation, C being the amount of contents there to be evacuated. That's what you assumed in the back page of lab one. There's some other more indirect ways that have been widely applied because they're easy. Uh, one of them is to use uh, what's called the Winberg model for the Russian G.G. Winberg that did a lot of this kind of work. Winberg's model says that the rate of consumption in ordinary fish, in ordinary situations, in nature, is uh, 1.25 times the rate at which those fish are engaged in respiration plus the rate at which they're growing. So if you've got some lab data on routine respiration and you've got some growth data from looking at the progression of modal sizes in the field, you can probably estimate um, you know, what the fish are needing to achieve that. Uh, this amounts to assuming that the metabolic energy or metabolized energy is 80% of ingested energy, which is a rule of thumb that's widely applied. So take the respiration rate, add the growth rate in common dimensions, obviously. You're going to have to convert everything to the same kind of dimensions, whatever you do. And multiply by 1.25, and that's the rate of consumption in those dimensions. Why do I say it's 80%? Well, 
I say it because if I take 1.25 and divide it into both sides of this equation, I end up with 0.5 AC. So 80% of AC is metabolizable energy, or AR plus AG. That's what metabolizable energy is defined to be. Okay, so then uh, that's all I'm going to say for now about consumption. I'm going to move on and talk about the outputs. You know, that's the input. Everything is, the only thing there is is AC. It's got to support everything else. Um, the outputs, we'll start with respiration. And I'll do here as I did in lab, and I'll distinguish among three components. Uh, standard metabolism. Uh, the activity component of metabolism and the one in between there is uh, the, the component associated with overhead uh, processing the other components. Uh, A sub D or SDA. The D comes from the D and SDA where SDA stands for Specific Dynamic Action. And we'll, I'll talk in detail about these terms. So uh, AR is the only term in the energy budget that is directly related to and therefore can be measured by oxygen uptake. Nothing else in the budget can be measured directly as oxygen uptake rate. And to convert between oxygen and energy units, we use what's called an oxycaloric equivalent. And I've already, you've already met and fell in love, I'm sure, with the oxycaloric equivalent. And the one that's used in fish work for fish eating uh, processing a normal mix of substrates is 3.4 calories per milligram of oxygen. So when you use a milligram of oxygen, that's saying you process 3.4 calories of energy. You can do respirometry to measure this uh, respiration rate, and you can, do, uh, you can then resolve the rate into its component parts. So here I'm going to talk about resolving the activity and the routine components. And we didn't talk about this in lab because what you did was routine. Uh, or rather, I'm going to, what we're going to do here is talk about resolving standard and activity components. And what you measured was sort of the aggregate of these uh, as a routine metabolism. And you didn't try to partition the two. Here's the way that they tend to be partitioned uh, in real fish. Uh, if activity increases, measured as a swimming speed, for example, in body lengths per second, maybe, um, between nil and some maximum sustainable speed, then the total oxygen uptake associated with that combined standard and activity metabolism tends to accelerate as an exponential. And... Uh, that means the logarithm of oxygen uptake rate tends to be a linear function of speed. And the intercept estimates standard metabolic rate, maybe. Um, we can even say what the slope is. The slope tends to be 0.5 per, uh, on a body length per second basis. If you measure speed in body length per second, the slope tends to be 0.5 for a lot of fish. So there's the the algebra. And so the, the, the interpretation is obvious. The interpretation is that, you know, if you're down here at zero speed, then everything you're doing is just standard metabolism. You're not doing any activity. And then as you pick up the pace, the total uptake increases along this exponential. So the difference between the intercept term and the height of the curve at every value of speed is an estimate of the activity component of metabolism. Now, there is a special word that's caused a lot of confusion, and you know these these are the accidents that happen historically um, with labels that take on a whole new life. And one of those labels is active metabolism. You know, what's the difference, you say, between why are you being careful to say activity, component of metabolism, versus active metabolism? And my answer to you is, here is active metabolism. That's the only value shown on the graph that's active metabolism. It is the maximum 
oxygen uptake for an animal that is engaged in the maximum sustainable level of activity. An active animal, so to speak. Just kind of forgot the word maximally active, you know, as we develop this through the literature and the history. So the active metabolic rate is the maximum metabolic rate that's possible under aerobic conditions. That is where you're actually not uh, engaging in anything except active or aerobic metabolism. Is everybody with me on the difference between activity component of metabolism, which is this component here, the difference between the blue line and the dashed line all the way along, that's a variable term, and the maximum value of the total of the two. And the total, you know, the active metabolism is the sum of the maximum activity metabolism and standard metabolism. It's all the metabolism under conditions of maximum sustainable activity. But without any a sub D component. In other words, we do this with fasted fish, so we don't we don't make them work to process the meal. Truth be known, they probably wouldn't anyhow. You know, in the in the short term transient state, what happens if you got a fish that's got a full meal and you're forcing it to swim as fast as it can go? It just shuts off the processing and lets it sit there like lead. How do, you, how do you do these experiments? And, you know, I used to have a whole bunch of slides in here. Uh, well, I guess I got a couple, but I used to have some pictures of respirometers. You know, and you, you've already got a good picture of a routine respirometer, and they can be pretty fancy, as you saw. You know, they can have all kinds of electronics. But active respirometers, and again, there's the label, active respirometer. Even though we're not measuring active metabolism most of the time, it's activity metabolism you're trying to estimate. Those, those machines tend to be very elaborate and involve a whole lot of hydraulic physics and sophistication. You know, you have to have a way to move the water uh, that the fish is in so that the fish is forced to swim against the current. Um, and normally, and normally that means you've got a, a flume or a swim tunnel uh, a loop of pipe with a pump at one point and a chamber at another point where the fish is and maybe you've got some, you know, uh, little uh, grids of wires and you shock the heck out of the fish if it doesn't play the game the way you want it to. Although normally I find that uh, punishment's not a very good way to get animals to cooperate. It's better to reinforce positive things. Uh, but those are all beyond the pale here, I guess, or the scope of what we can spend time talking about. Um, you know, there's all kinds of fancy. I uh, wish we had time, and maybe, maybe sometimes we'd just like to get together and chat about respirometry and, and active respirometers and um, water tunnels, Brett respirometers versus the Volschlag respirometer. Uh, versus the fry respirometer that was a turntable spinning, and uh, which was really neat. We tried to apply that with tunas and had a, an interesting but not very successful time. So, uh, you know, this this is an attempt to show uh, how routine respirometry, uh, how the how the results look when you do routine respirometry starting. Uh, at time zero, putting the animal into the into the respirometer, and when it's all excited and everything, and maybe it's recovering from an oxygen debt that it was that it incurred when it was being netted or something. So it starts out with a real high metabolic rate that's approaching the active rate, maybe. And then as time passes, there's a lot of variation, fluctuations. But at some point, we get down to a relatively stable situation where uh, routine uptake is bouncing around between uh, a floor that's uh, estimating the standard metabolic rate and something higher than that, which is the routine maximum, I should say there, not just VO2R, but that's sort of the maximum routine rate under ordinary conditions. And then we feed the fish, and right away we get a spike in oxygen uptake that's associated with excitement when the fish are all swimming around. So it's activity metabolism increasing, triggered by the, the fish's behavioral response to the fact that it got fed. 
And then that goes away, and then after a while, uh, uh, oxygen uptake tends to increase again. And that time is variable and may not be for a few hours. In the case of ecofish, we thought it was maximum about 12 hours. Somewhere between 4 and 16 hours, I would say. And that's the food processing. The metabolism, the increase in oxygen uptake associated with the work that's being done to process the food that's been eaten and the transformations that are going on. And then you get to fall back to something that's more routine again. Um, as I look at this graph, you know, I think it's kind of, well, it's okay, but I, I probably would have drawn it a little differently if I were drawing it again today. And one of the things I would have tried to make, make happen here is that I would have had the routine metabolic rate under this stable set of conditions sort of centering on a value that's about twice the standard rate. As it is now, the maximum value of the routine is sort of twice the standard, but the minimum is right on the, you know, so that it's about time and a half, right? Looks like about one and a half times there the way I drew it. Minor point, I guess. The standard component of metabolism is the part that goes on all the time that's, uh, you know, required to support existence biologically. And... Um, it, uh, it represents uh, oxygen uptake to support and energy uptake to support the costs that have to be met on a continuing basis just to stay alive, like conversion of energy stores and just inputs that feed into intermediary metabolism. Basal transport process is just working the buccal and the opercular pumps at basal rates uh, to provide basal ventilation. And circulation, you know, pumping the blood at the rate that's consistent with keeping yourself going. Uh, fighting the flux of water and ions between the, the outside world and the blood. Basal osmoregulation. And then you got to, over the long term, you got to make up things that wear out. You know, you got to replace the structural parts that wear down. What's the range? I don't know that this is... Uh, real important or meaningful, but uh, what I got here is uh, from zero to a thousand calories per gram per day. And uh, for species and sizes of teleos and under the environmental conditions that you ordinarily see, somewhere between four and 20 calories per gram per day. And that would correspond if you do the oxycaloric division by dividing the calories by 3.4, that's going to give you something between about 0.05 and 25, 0.25 milligrams of oxygen per gram per day. So, you know, depending on the size of the animal and environmental conditions, basal metabolism is going to use up somewhere around a few hundredths of a milligram of oxygen per gram per hour and... I said divide by 3.4. You're going to have to do some other stuff. You're going to have to get days to hours. Here I wasn't paying attention. Um, but Zoe was. I could see the doubt in her eyes there. No, I couldn't. So you get my point. I, I made a little a slip of the mind here. I said all you got to do is take your 3.4 calories per milligram and do a division. But you got to do something more than that because that's, gram, that's calories per gram day. And this is milligrams per gram hour. So you're going to have a factor of 24 in there, too, to deal with. And that, that comes with the territory. You know, we usually do respirometry per hour, but we do bioenergetics per day. So are those ranges important? Probably not. Not unless you're doing respirometry. Um, Maybe these things uh, are a little more important, and maybe a lot more. One is that standard metabolic rate varies among species, uh, being greater in more active forms. And if you consider uh, ecofish versus a tuna, the same size, we're probably talking about three times the standard metabolism of ecofish to get to the tuna, the same size. Or what I mean is a gener general fish, a generic fish. So standard metabolic rates of tunas are about three times those of non-tunas. 
Uh, standard metabolism varies with the size in a very, uh, uh, well, a very uh, dramatic way that's been very heavily researched. Uh, it tends to be greater in smaller individuals. And so the standard metabolic rate tends to be proportional to weight to about the minus 0.2 power for fishes. And when I say the, the A sub S, remember the dimensions here are per unit animal, mass or energy or something. So, you know, A sub S, I told you on about the second slide, has dimensions like energy per unit energy per unit time. And so what we're talking about here is the per unit animal rate going uh, down as the animal gets bigger. Uh, the whole animal goes up the total because logic should tell you that if the per unit per gram rate of metabolism is proportional to weight to the minus 0.2 then you multiply both sides of that proportionality by weight to the one to find out what the whole animal gives and when you multiply a sub s times weight you just get the whole animal's metabolism and when you multiply weight to the minus 0.2 by weight to the one you know you remember you uh, add the exponents and so you're adding a minus 0.2 and a plus 0.1, so you get a plus 0.8. And folks, don't come out of my course and say that you are a biologist if you can't make the connection between per unit weight of metabolism and whole animal. If I tell you what the per unit rate is as a function of weight, you ought to be able to tell me what the whole animal rate per unit weight is. And you'd be surprised how many professional Fish people and other biologists have never got that figured out. I've reviewed a bunch of manuscripts over my career where people have gotten fouled up about this difference. It's as simple as taking the per unit rate and multiplying both sides of the relationship by whole weight. Now we're just doing a proportionality here and maybe I shouldn't have done it that way because people get confused and they see that little half of a, they see that little part of a uh, infinity sign with one end cut off. But I could have made it an equality by putting a, a constant in here in front of the weight to get the dimensions the right way. Still works the same way, right? If AS is equal to uh, A times weight to the minus 0.2, then AS times W is going to be equal to A times weight to the plus 0.8. You think you could tell me that back if I ask you, Chris, you know, on the exam? What is the weight, what is the per unit weight rate of metabolism in fish? You know, what function of weight is it typically? Is it weight to the zero power? Weight to the one? Weight to the minus point? Yes, weight to the minus point two. And not weight to the plus point eight if it's per unit rate. Now, if I say what's the whole animal's metabolic rate, so metabolism per fish per unit time, as a function of its weight, then you're talking about weight to the plus 0.8 power. We're talking about an increasing rate, but one that's increasing ever more slowly. So the power is not 1, it's 0.8. Is everybody comfortable with that? If you're not comfortable with that, talk to me about it. And that goes for people here in the room as well as people who aren't in the room. Uh, standard metabolism also varies with temperature in a very dramatic and, and consistent way, I guess, or semi-consistent. So dramatic it's got all kinds of names, you know, Arrhenius effect, Van Hoff law, uh, Q10. It's got a lot of labels. And you've already learned some things about that in lab two. And the rule is that the standard metabolic rate tends to increase with temperature it tends to be an exponential function of temperature. That is, the standard met metabolic rate of a fish tends to be proportional to E, the exponential base raised to the power, a constant times temperature. I, I use the constant, I use the symbolic little Q because I want to think about big Q because big Q10 and little Q are related, as you well know. Um, What's the magnitude of Q? Well, it's between 0.09 and 0.07. And 
and that doesn't mean much, but everybody's heard that Q10 is between 2 and 3. And it turns out that a little Q of 0.09 corresponds with a Q10 of 3, and the 0.07 corresponds with 2. And in that lab, you know, I ask you to show me that you can calculate the relationship between the two, and you ought to be able to do that. I probably wouldn't ask you to do it on the exam. And I probably wouldn't ask you to memorize what's the numeric value of little q versus big Q10. But you ought to have, you ought to be comf- you ought to be able to do it for your, you know, not necessarily under pressure, but at, in the leisure of the middle of the night when you've got some time and you're thinking. So, anyhow. So standard metabolism is is strongly influenced by the weight of the animal and by the temperature of the environment where that animal is working. That's the two biggies there. Um, This A sub D component, food processing, sometimes it's called a parent SDA. And in homeotherm uh, bioenergetics, you know, if you go over across the tracks and you work with somebody over there on chickens or beef cattle, you'll probably hear it called heat increment instead of SDA. Um, the, I already explained the D is is there because somebody decided they didn't want to use S because they were already using that for standard. They didn't want to use A because they were using that for activity. So they picked the D in the middle and said, let's call it D. You know, for SDA, dynamic. Um, it's the elevation of, of routine metabolism or uh, elevation of total metabolism attributable to the, the activities that are going on inside associated with processing the food all the way from producing the, the bile salts and the hydrochloric acid and the enzymes to doing transformations in the liver um, all those things get get um, aggregated as as apparent SDA. It looks like that in a typical case, about two thirds of SDA, two thirds of AD, I should say, may actually be true SDA, which is the cost uh, associated with deaminating proteins, uh, uh, deaminating amino acids that are the digestive products of proteins. Breaking off that M- amine group, that NH2, that costs you energy, and about two thirds of the thing that's measured as A sub D tends to be related to that. The other third is everything else. A real handy rule of thumb that's held up very well, maybe surprisingly well, in bioenergetics with fish is that the A sub D component tends to be a fixed fraction of A sub C. So you tell me how much A sub C is and I'll tell you A sub D. It's 15%. But the time is, is, you know, you're assuming a steady state. So A sub C may be, you know, a, a, achieved uh, in, a, in a single gulp, you know, by a predatory fish. And then the A sub D gets paid out over time. So you have to integrate the A sub C and the A sub D in order to get this 15%. Is everybody clear on that? You can't just estimate the oxygen uptake of the ecofish or anything else at this instant and get the difference and claim that that is going to be 15% of AC. It's not. But if you average things over long periods of time and express A sub C per unit weight per day and A sub D per day, then maybe it's 15 a sub D tends to be independent of fish size and independent of temperature, which is very handy. You don't need any more complexity. It's already complex enough. It's lucky that A sub D tends to be pretty much just a function of how much you eat. And we'll finish up by a brief consideration of A sub A, the activity component. And I've already told you a lot of stuff about it. I've told you that that component increases as speed increases in an exponential way. I've even told you what the slope of the 
log transform is. Uh, at the maximum sustain speed, call it S max, a little s for speed. Um, a sub A typically is about 10 times A sub S for fish. So I guess we're saying that maximum or active metabolism tends to be about 11 times, you know, um, A sub S because A sub S is part of A sub uh, maximum. So activity metabolism about 10 times A sub S when you're at the maximum sustained speed. At the maximum, uh, folks have broken down the proportions and estimated that 60% of the activity component is going to the actual propulsive, mus propulsive musculature to power it, the metabolism going on in the muscle. 40% is going to supporting functions. 10% uh, to increase branchial pumping. That is, putting more water over the gills that you have to do to be more active. 12% increased cardiac pumping, heart work, and then maybe a surprising 18% due to increased osmoregulatory work because if you're pumping more water and more blood at the interface of exchange, the primary interface, then there's more flux that you have to work against to maintain if you want to maintain constant blood uh, osmo concentration. Um, I already told you that the activity component tends to be an exponential function of swimming speed. And I've even mentioned that B tends to be about 0.5 when S is expressed in body lengths per second, which is a common way of scaling speed to the size of the animal, body lengths per second. Actually, obviously, an absolute in an absolute sense, a meter long fish that's moving at a body length per second is moving a lot faster, absolute, than a 10 centimeter fish moving at five body lengths a second, right? There's that same figure again that you just saw. A couple of asides and we'll be done. Swimming speed. Maximum sustained speed, S max for ordinary size telios, uh, you know, in the range of fish that we work with in the lab of, say, 100 to 1,000 <coughs> grams. Ranges from about 3 to about 10 body lengths a second. With the smaller value being for the larger fish. So little fish swim faster per unit length per unit time than big fish. And in fact, larval fish can sustain speeds that probably are outside this range. But you know, you don't live to be very, you don't live very long as a larva, so it sort of gets to be a little bit, uh, you know, the whole idea of transient versus steady state really doesn't apply there. Say three to 10 body lengths. You know, you go catch a fish, catch a bass, catch a nice bass, two or three pounds, it's gonna be able to sustain probably three or four body lengths per second. And the definition of sustain, by the way, is all in the eye of the beholder. And what most people mean is, hey, how long can I expect it to stay in the respirometer? And so usually it's about 20 minutes. So if you can do it for 20 minutes, that's sustained. The idea is that there's a balance, you know, the oxygen balance has to be achieved over 20 minutes or so. Uh, burst speeds are the speeds that fish can achieve over short periods of time measured in, a, in a seconds, maybe a couple of seconds. And those tend to be way greater, 10 to 20 body lengths per second, I would say would be uh, the right range. And probably the tunas, you know, are the ones that are up there in the 20 to 30 body lengths a second. Um, make this last point up to the S max metabolism is aerobic after that anything that's beyond that has to be increasingly anaerobic and uh, the point I'll make and I'll end here well I'll tell a story and we'll, we'll end with the story I won't quite finish this the story has to do with timing the burst speeds of tuna and uh, did some of the work like that when I was with the fishery service in Hawaii we talked to folks at um, uh, the Institute, well, talk to folks at, at Sea Life Park 
they had a they had a big oceanarium sized tank and they had an underwater observation uh, chamber with a bubble window looking into the tank and uh, we set up a Bolex high speed movie camera down there and had a school of skipjack in this tank and we trained them Chris so that when the technician stood on one side of the oceanarium tank with a handful of these uh, white bait uh, smelt that we fed them and through those things it was like feeding a bunch of bird dogs you know they they take off they watch they're very visual and they go streaking across that tank you know you'd, you'd lure them over to this side by giving chumming them a little bit and then throw a handful across the water uh, perpendicular to the axis of the camera and lens and then film them as they swim past and do a frame by frame analysis to estimate the speed correcting for parallax and all those things and we were getting, you know, 20, 25 body lengths a second for half meter long fish, which is moving right along, you know. So if it's 20 body lengths a second and you're a half meter long, I think that's 10 meters a second. That's the length of this room or more in one second. So that's the story for today. We'll quit there. Lab this afternoon.